Tell me about it, Diane. There's a lot of arguments. Put it really short and sweet. I knew they were drinking antifreeze. Diane Stati seemed to be a woman plagued by misfortune, having grieved the deaths of her two family members and almost losing a third in just over a year. But on June 20th, 2013, she's accused of poisoning each of them with ethylene glycol, otherwise known as antifreeze. And I was so mad at him, I didn't want to take him in. I delayed. Two weeks ago, Diane's 24-year-old daughter, Sarah, arrived at the ER in dire condition. As her daughter lay comatose between bouts of pained screaming, Diane laughed, joked, and mused with nurses about her upcoming holiday to Florida. But this is just a trace of the evil that's taken root in the Stouty family. After a short flu-like illness, Diane's 61-year-old husband, Mark, was found deceased blood still drying around his mouth on April 8, 2012. Her son, Sean, was found under identical circumstances on September 2nd, just five months later, at the age of 26. Confronted with this string of maladies, Diane explains that, against all reason, three members of her family started drinking antifreeze opting for identical, atypical, and excruciating deaths. Diane was reportedly calm when she arrived at the Springfield, Missouri police station, but doesn't hide her anxiety quite so well once alone in the interview room. A dedicated parishioner and organ player at her local Lutheran church, she clasps her hands in prayer as she waits for Detective Neil McCamus to join her. Is it stout? Stouty. Stouty? Okay. Well, again, Miss Dowdy, I, I appreciate you being willing to come down and speak with us. You're very helpful on your part. I try to be. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Don't I'll, know what I can tell you. Well, okay. Well, that's what we're going to try and get figured out. Um, Diane wants to appear oblivious and therefore innocent. But after speaking with medical staff caring for a comatose Sarah, McCamus already has plenty of reason to dig beneath this facade. Hospital staff confided in him that Sarah's symptoms couldn't be explained by tests for diseases, drugs, and allergies, stirring concern that she could have been poisoned. Obviously, like I told you, Alice, it's, we got the call about Sarah and and her condition, but you say she's doing better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when did all this come about? Uh, she started feeling sick Saturday, you know, just a mild this headache. Past, this yeah, past Saturday? This past, well, it's been a whole week. Diane's initial story is that Sarah started showing flu-like symptoms on Saturday, June 8th. Her condition worsened as she began vomiting and losing consciousness and was completely unresponsive when Diane and her other daughter, Rachel, returned from church that Sunday. Together, they rushed Sarah to the ER, though neither they nor hospital personnel expected her to survive. It's like, okay, this is not good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like something's wrong. Mm -hmm. All right. And what did they, what did they say at the hospital? Uh, basically, she was as sick as sick could get. But no idea what it was? We had no clue. Still don't really have a clue. I mean, with, with her medical background, she's bipolar. Okay. My first thing is, did she get into something? You know, did she try to overdose or something? And then when I got home from the ER, I checked her medicine, and she had plenty of pills left, so I don't think she owed her medicine, but I have no clue. Diane highlights her efforts to investigate on her own. She hopes McCamus will see that she's invested in finding the cause of Sarah's illness and attentive to her daughter's well-being. Yet, she struggles to find a balance between appearing helpful yet oblivious. And throughout this interview, she'll frequently return to her favorite phrase, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. So you don't know how else she might have done it? No. Okay. I mean, I if she did find something to take, I have no clue. Okay. You have any idea what it would be that she'd find to take? Oh, gosh. I don't know. As far as pills, I don't have much. <laughs> Diane wouldn't be the first person to retreat behind the coping mechanism of humor 
But statements from friends, family and fellow churchgoers show this behaviour isn't just a quirk of grief. Their pastor felt he was more emotional than Diane following Mark's death. And the church's music director agreed she was just as unemotional when Sean died, calling her demeanor bizarre. At no point did Diane act in a way you'd expect from a grieving wife or mother. You thought maybe she could have gotten into some cleaners or something? Yeah, because I, I know I have cleaners and I don't What else is there? What kind of cleaners do you think it could have been that she would have? What do I have? I can't see her taking soap. <laughs> Yuck. Um, the general, you know, everyday cleaner. I have some of that. What's, what would that be? What's the name of it? Lysol. Okay. I know I have that, but... Could you, could you even hurt yourself from soap or Lysol? Do you know? I'm not... I have no clue. No, okay. <laughs> I, I don't even think about... Right. I've just like never that. heard of anything like that, so I don't... I haven't either. It's like, but I, I guess... I don't know. This incredulity is the first hint of challenge from McAmos. Depending on the concentration of specific products, Lysol can be fatal. But factors like taste would make it difficult to consume a lethal dose. Notably, Diane didn't check if any cleaners were missing, as she did with Sarah's medication. Nor did she note what products she had, so she might suggest what medical staff should test for. Her own little investigation is erratic, because in reality, it's nothing more than a pretense. She knows cleaners had nothing to do with Sarah's condition. And from what I understand, you, you're you um, in the medical field? Is mm -hmm. I'm a nurse. You're a nurse? Okay. But I'm a cardiology nurse. I know hearts. But... Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And from what I understand, too, um, I think you're pretty well respected in your profession. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And yeah. You, so you... Is there anything from your knowledge? I know you say you, we deal with the heart and stuff, but from your knowledge, is there anything that you could think of that it could have been? Because obviously, from what we understand, you're pretty intelligent. Yeah. You're, you know, I mean, this is. I what, try. Yeah. But I, I really can't think of anything. I mean, I don't know. Psych's not my thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I understand that. That's a whole different realm, and mm -hmm. it's like you know, just. McCamus stokes Diane's ego to build rapport, but Diane is wary of appearing too knowledgeable about healthcare. She claims her expertise is limited to hearts, but she's selling herself short there. Diane would have trained as a nurse in all areas, developing a broad base of knowledge before specializing in cardiology. She certainly knows more than just hearts, but must distance herself from this expertise if she wants to keep playing dumb. If she did take some cleaners or something, could that, I mean, could that essentially? Well, I can see that hurting the kidneys, but that wouldn't cause her brain. I mean, she had a brain bleed. Oh, she had a brain bleed? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's like, that's, I can't figure that one out. Because hmm. I even asked, it's like, you're sure it's a bleed, not a stroke, you know, or a blood clot? Because that runs in my family, so. Would it be common for somebody that her age, though? That Because from my understanding, Sarah was in really good. Yeah, she was in good, as I mean, far as we know, she health, was in good great health. physical health, yeah. yeah. Have, um, have your other kids had any type problems or? No. No. Nothing. I thought about that too. It's like, where did we eat? Mm -hmm. And it's like, but we all eat the same thing. Despite McAmos's expectant pause, Diane dodges the subject of her deceased son and husband. McAmos withholds the fact he knows the names, ages, and fates of every Stouty. His feigned ignorance disguising any manipulative tactics. If Diane views him as clueless and his questions unfocused, she'll be unwary as he steers her towards topics she desperately wants to avoid. So this is as much of a medical mystery to you as it is for the doctors and what you're saying. Yeah. Huh? I have no clue. Is she able to talk now? Yeah. Have you been able to talk to her? Uh, yeah. And she doesn't remember. She doesn't remember anything. She doesn't remember anything. See, that makes me question. It's like, well, did she do something? Mm -hmm. 
And if she did, I'd sure as heck like to know what so I could prevent it again. I can't go through this again. What do you mean? Can't it's go through this rough. again? Oh, you mean this whole ordeal? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It's rough. Much to McCamus's dismay, Diane is not finally ready to vent about the trauma of losing her husband and son. Instead, she's preoccupied with how taxing this interview has been for poor old Diane. McCamus will just have to broach the other deaths himself. Do you have a son as well? No, not anymore. No, he died. He died. He had, he had a seizure disorder. When did he die? Uh, it was last fall. How old was he? He was... 26. He'd had several strokes. So was his kind of an unexpected or? It wasn't a complete surprise. We, we knew he'd been sick. So what, what was wrong with him? Um, he was severely autistic, um, had several strokes starting when he was a baby, and then he had a seizure disorder. What's the seizure disorder? Um... He would just have seizures. Like any time he would get sick, he would have seizures. If it wasn't clear that Diane purposely keeps the dead at arm's length, it must be now. Sean, having died from a stroke, was a glaring omission when she outlined the family's history of blood clots. These health problems were present from Sean's infancy, before Diane had any reason or chance to poison him. So if anything, this information would make it more believable that he died from natural causes. But alas, Diane's evasion gives away her unease, and McCamus heightens this by questioning how someone could die this way. This is ultimately a bluff, because though rare, sudden death during a seizure does happen. Nevertheless, this maintains pressure on Diane's weak points, chipping away at her confidence. And he died of the seizure disorder? How does, how does one die from something like that? Um, well, if you're alone, and this is what, this is what the, his was an autopsy case. They said they found an area in his brain where you, he had a lot more brain damage than we thought. And they're saying that's what caused the seizures and apparently he stopped breathing during one of his seizures. Hmm. Is that common for people to, to die? I've, never, I've just never heard of anybody dying from a seizure before. Is that, is that, is it, that pretty it common? Happen. It can happen. How common is it, though? Is it, I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. You haven't experienced much with, within your profession then? Or? Not that much. Okay. So I've never heard of that before. He, and you said your husband died at home also? Mm -hmm. The same house you're in now? No, it's a different house. We moved. So you moved, obviously, then after... Your husband died. Okay. Do you own this house that you're in now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, me and the bank. You know, okay. All right. Pardon me real quick. I'll be right back. There are a few options for where to apply pressure moving forward. Diane's new house points to a financial motive, while the grudges against her family members equally warrant scrutiny. All McCamus knows for sure is that Diane is not the bewildered mask she presents. So he leaves to consult with his team, returning with more focused questioning. I'd like to talk with you just a little bit more about trying to figure out, do you know any specific type of cleaners or anything that she could have gotten into? Could somebody even, like, taste-wise, could they even stomach ingesting something like that? With I don't know. I McCamus wonders aloud whether one could even consume Diane's cleaners. He guides the narrative closer to the investigation's current theory. Hospital personnel advise that Sarah may have been poisoned with a heavy metal like arsenic, given it lacks an odor or taste. Antifreeze is known for being sweet or tasteless depending on the product, and better yet, has a consistency identical to water. These substances could be administered without a victim's knowledge, and accordingly, McCamus will raise the notion of foul play for the first time. Who, who tastes? <laughs> I don't even know what 
I don't even want to know what they taste yeah. like. Yeah. Do you know of anybody else that would want to harm her? You said you'd be surprised if she wanted to harm herself. Do you know of anybody else that would want to harm her? You said she doesn't really have any friends. No. And I, I can't even think of anybody. I mean, most everybody that knows her, you know, she's a sweetie. So I, I can't think of anybody. So you can't think of anybody? No. Do her and Rachel get along? Mm-hmm. You don't think Rachel would have anything? To, no. No? No. I don't think Rachel could hurt a fly. Maybe a wasp. This is interesting phrasing on Diane's part. Typically, this expression describes a complete and utter pacifist. Contrasting with a wasp implies such a pacifist could commit violence if the victim somehow deserved it. In this case, thanks to the threat posed by a wasp's sting. With this in mind, McCamus will uncover the factors that make one worthy of harm, at least in Diane's eyes. And you said you go to Redeemer Lutheran Church. Are you pretty active in church, or are you? Okay. I'm, I'm their organist. Oh, okay. Wow. How long <laughs> yeah. have you been doing that? Oh, gosh. 30 plus years. Oh, boy. Long time. Wow. Did the, did the girls or was Mark, was he active in the church as well? Or? Um, not as active, no. but he went. Okay. How about Sean? What? Um, Sean didn't like to go because he didn't like the, it was too many people. The girls are, do they attend much? Rachel is there all the time. Um, Rihanna likes to go during the week. Less people. Mm -hmm. What about Sarah? Sarah never really liked to go that much. Okay. I'm trying to change her to see if she will. Yeah. The only family members who haven't wandered close to death are those who regularly attend church with Diane. McCamus again appeals to Diane's ego with his comments about her organ playing, showing he appreciates the value of religion and her dedication to it. If Diane has a holier-than-thou sense of superiority over her victims, this validation makes her more comfortable with opening up to McCamus. Because we've s spoken with the medical examiner about that, and I guess when they first did it, they really didn't look too much into if there was any types of chemicals or anything at all in his system or anything else like that. But when we, we did talk to them, they they did were, were able to tell us that they... Just like with all autopsies, if you're familiar with those, they, you know, they take tissue samples and hair samples and all kinds of other samples and they yeah. basically keep them for a while. And fortunately, they still had a, have a bunch of his stuff. And so they're going to do a bunch of tests on his stuff as well. Okay. As a nurse, Diane isn't privy to the ins and outs of autopsies. With Mark and Sean's remains cremated, she likely thought herself safe from that class of evidence. With this rug pulled from underfoot, Diane has yet more reason to doubt she can get away with this. McCamus continues to feed her anxiety as he queries the nature of Sean's death. So if his stuff were to come back with anything like that, something similar to maybe this, what Sarah's might come back with. How would you explain that? I don't know. I really don't know. It, again, it depends on what shows up. And what do you think it might be? I don't know. I really don't know. Think there could be anything maybe malicious or suspicious in, involved with that? I can't think of that. Yeah. Would you be surprised if something like that came back? Yeah, would you? I, I think so. I think I would be surprised. Okay. I mean, Why would you I be never, surprised? Well, I never anticipated anything showing up, mm -hmm. you know? You you never anticipated anything showing up. Why why would you why do you, why would you not well, anticipate anything showing up? Because I I really don't know what. How can I say this? It makes sense. 
Though Diane is cognizant enough to verbally show surprise, her emotional reaction is pitiable. She should be surprised. By her account, these were unavoidable deaths caused by pre-existing conditions, so foul play would be a frightening prospect given the number of victims. Diane ought to be disturbed that her family was maliciously targeted, but she sticks to her oblivious act, even as it fails. What was Mark's life insurance policy like? Uh, he only had 20000 How about Sean? Sean only had fifteen. What about Sarah? Sarah only has fifteen. Rachel? And Rachel has fifteen. And Brianna? Has fifteen. Okay. And you were able to get the, the money from Mark and Sean's, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. It took a while. So, yeah, but finally. you didn't write. And what did you do with, with that money? Um, with Mark's, we were able to move into a better neighborhood. Right. How about Sean's? With Sean's, I haven't even... Right now, it's still in savings because I haven't quite figured out what to do yet. Okay. With some, what were your plans? Some things are... I'm thinking more of just paying off bills. Okay. It's strange that every Stoutie has life insurance. Sarah, Rachel, and the youngest Stoutie, nine-year-old Brianna, had no pre-existing conditions that would warrant policies for such young people. Diane does work for an insurance company and could therefore view life insurance more highly than the average person. But what's less intelligible is how she used Mark and Sean's life insurance payouts. Diane purchased a new house and bolstered her savings, but fails to mention any funeral, cremation, or related costs. At the forefront of Diane's mind are her material gains. Oftentimes, you know, there, there's cases that come up that are similar to this, where people are harmed, you know, by other people, and there's there's always a reason. If somebody was to harm, their, you know, let's their deaths were because of something like that. If somebody was to harm them, why do you think that would be? What would be the reason for them, for somebody to want to harm them? I don't know about my kids, but Mark had a lot of weird friends. Well, I don't know if I'd call them friends. Acquaintances. What was your his marriage like? Um, how can I say this? We were still married, but it was not what you call a good marriage. Mm -hmm. Have there been any infidelities on either side? He had. He had. So I'm guessing then just briefly thought he wasn't the best husband? Mm, probably not. Okay. Not not to society, no. What do you mean by that, not to society? Well, he was running around and he would drink and smoke pot. and. So he wasn't a very good guy is what not, you're saying? Yeah. I know, you know, I've had friends who told me I should kick him out, but I couldn't find myself kicking him out. Why not? I was afraid he'd kill himself. Why is that, though? Why would he kill himself? Oh, he was bipolar, too. Was there, um, we talked about some of the financial stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have, had you ever had any financial problems? I know you said you were able to move into a better neighborhood after Mark died and no, no financial really. issues. Did Mark work at all? No. No, he didn't work? No. So what did he do then? Uh, play music. Okay. So you were the breadwinner for the, for the family. He didn't work, didn't bring home any money for you guys. And, but your job's good enough that you were able to support the family. And mm -hmm. then when he died from his insurance money, you were able to upgrade it to yeah. because you have a nice house out there now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it just means I didn't have to borrow from my 401k for once. Okay. And you mentioned, you talked about Mark. It sounds like you're a very godly woman, Christian woman. Um, Mark sounds like he wasn't that way. And uh, off and on, off and on. Okay. And Sean, you say he wasn't too much into church. And no, neither was Sarah. Not really. As the motive of interpersonal conflict comes into focus, McCamus must keep Diane's guard lowered. He affirms her as the dutiful breadwinner, saintly, in the face of a neglectful family, keeping Diane eager to complain. 
had you tried to get Mark, Sean, and Sarah to get more into church and be mm-hmm. more, you know, with yeah. God? Mm-hmm. Okay. They just wouldn't quite. Well, Sarah, Sarah's been trying to go more. That might change. That might, that, can't talk. That might change. Because she's been enjoying the pastors coming by and visiting her. So. Okay. That kind of gets us back to why somebody may want to harm any of them. And it sounds like you don't want to come out and say it, but it sounds like Mark really, did, did he not treat you that well? That's hard to say. I mean, I, I didn't think it was that bad. But my kids would probably say otherwise. Mm-hmm. Was there ever any physical abuse towards you? No. Nothing like that? No. He just had some extramarital affairs, and Mm -hmm. you said he did some drugs and smoked and drank a lot. Okay. Did you um, did you do that around the kids? Any? Did they know that he was involved? They knew. They knew. They knew. So that probably didn't sit very Uh, well with you. I wasn't happy. (laughs) Okay. Was Sean involved in anything like that? Did he drink or use any drugs or? Not that I know of. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Miss Todd, there's there's been some things that have come up. We've been investigating this for a while. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's been some things that have come up during the investigation. Some of it to do with some tests that have been done on Sarah. Okay. And then again, some of it from when we've started working with the doctors that had performed the autopsy. So there's some questions that need to be answered about okay. about that. And I'm hoping that we can get an explanation because I know that you um you know that you're a God fearing woman, you know, you strong in the church, you know, very, very dedicated to the church. You're somebody that knows um you know about the right thing and about God's way. Mm-hmm. I'm a believer myself. So I understand and where you're coming from on that. Sometimes in life, there's things that happen or things that go on that may not, you know, good people don't normally always do, but there's reasons for for sometimes people to slip up a little bit, make a mistake every now and then. You would agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. So... Here we are with this situation now where some stuff's been brought to our attention. And I think you're a very good lady okay. with, with the right intentions, right? Yeah, you try. I try. And, but, you know, sometimes, you know, everybody kind of reaches a, a tipping point or a breaking point and it gets, gets to where, you know, again, like I said, that maybe certain decisions are made that normally wouldn't be made for that. And with some of the stuff involved in these cases from what we've been looking at, I think you know what, why we're here talking. U.S. law enforcement can lie about evidence like this, making this a predictable stage in any interrogation. The suspect must feel around in the dark, deciding whether to call the detective's bluff while investigators listen for some slip-up or admission. But things are different this time round. In most cases we've covered so far, the accused was interrogated shortly after the crime, from mere hours later to a few weeks at most. Diane's strategy is burdened by the variables of time and her poison of choice. Sarah's a difficult child Mm -hmm. to deal with. I understand. And I've been kind of putting pressure on her to, you know, you need to get out and get a job. Your college bills are coming due. I don't want to pay for them. You know, after all, you get tired of doing everything for your kids. And it's like, you need to step up and do it. As far as did I do something to her, I didn't do anything to her. I mean, I, I guess I could have taken her to the ER sooner, but I didn't know. I'm just telling you, I didn't do anything. 
Diane admits to shameful but, importantly, non-criminal behavior, hoping McCamus will take pity and abandon this confrontation. Instead, McCamus turns these admissions against her, diverting attention from the impact on Sarah to the frustration that forced Diane to lash out. Lots of times, you know, when situations come about like that, there is a reason yeah. for whatever it be, you know. I completely understand what you're saying, Sarah. You know, I feel for you. If she, she's as old as she is, she's graduated school, she's got all these bills coming up. You're trying to get her to church, you're trying to get her to, to work, you're trying to get her to do these things, and she's not going along with it. And it's got to be just immensely frustrating for you. I completely understand that. I think that's exactly the case. I think Mark, he's having these infidelities. He's not working. You've got the whole burden of the family. You got to take care of everybody. You have all this stress and pressure on you to, to, to raise your kids, to put food on the table. You're the working one. He's out. He's drinking. He's using drugs. He's using drugs in front of your kids, which nobody would appreciate. He's doing things he shouldn't be doing. I think person just gets pushed to where you know what people just can't take it anymore whenever diane retreats behind her memory mccamus makes a rambling appeal to her righteous resentment asking no questions this tactic is more noticeable when he tries to incorporate diane's issues with sean mccamus doesn't have as many complaints to work with at this stage but he still manages to present sean as another straw on diane's back I think Sean is obviously burdened. He's not going to church. He's not, you know, probably doing what he should be doing, just like we've talked about. And then the same situation with Sarah. So when I look at this stuff, I think there's a person that just has been pushed, you know, taking all this stuff and it just keeps building up and building up and building up. And I think it just gets to the point of just can't say, you know, people can only take so much. With this conspicuous shuffle closer to Diane, let's assess how McCamus's position has changed since the start of this interview. Physical closeness will empathize the emotional connection he's formed with Diane and enhance the sense that this is a sensitive conversation with a trusted ally. I may not be the best mother in the world because I do wait a little longer before I take him to the doctor, but I didn't hurt my kids. And when Mark died, it was, it was actually a relief. I just don't tell people that. This isn't the confession McCamus wants, and he makes this clear with silence. I don't know what else to say. Well, Diane, again, you're in here for yeah. a reason. You know that I'm here to try and, and get your story. Because when this is all done, there's going to be a lot more people besides me that are going to have questions. But when this is all said and done, you know, people are going to have questions. They're going to de deserve some answers mm -hmm. and you're going to want them to know and have some kind of story about what it is because you don't want people thinking that you're mm -hmm. just bad because when all this stuff comes out, because it, it will, you don't want people to, to look at this and go, oh my gosh, you're going to want people to know why. And I think that's what you got to tell me, talk about why, so, so people are going to know and understand and realize, you know what, she, it's not about evil. It's not about just being bad. There's a reason. Well, is it bad if you argue with your kids and tell them? And I probably shouldn't have. It's like sometimes you'd be better off if you'd kill yourself. Diane adds melodrama to her story. Like there's some threshold of wickedness that can satiate McCamus's pursuit of a confession. 
This escalation builds up to her new version of events, one closer to the truth, but still devoid of criminal wrongdoing. And I know Sean, not too many people know this, but he did talk about killing himself too. But I don't, you know. Diane, we know that didn't happen. He didn't kill himself. No. No. You know that and we know that. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to talk about why things happen. It's not that fun. I understand. Not at all. And sometimes I look and it's like, why didn't I kill myself? Because I could have. Right. McCamus doesn't bite at this bait for sympathy. But when Diane expresses a genuine emotional concern, he's able to take advantage and wield this fear against her. You have to let me help you. Okay. I just want to be there for my girls. And my mind is just thinking legal things right now. I understand what you're saying. Like and it sounds like Rachel and Brianna, you know, were... You know, it sounds like they were good, good to you, and they didn't give you problems, mm -hmm. right? I well, understand most of the time. Most of the time, right? I understand that. I really <laughs> That's do. That's all kids, right? I do understand that, but they're going to have questions too, mm -hmm. and you're going to, you're going. I mean, this is why. I mean, you have to think about them because it sounds like you truly do care for Rachel and Brianna. It really does. And I care for and, Sarah. Right, and I care right, for Sean. Right. But it just got to the point with some of them that, you know, they, again, just couldn't take any more. So now you have to do the right thing for Rachel and Brianna. You have to, because you don't want them, you know, going around and, you know, having to hear about this stuff, about you being this really bad and evil, awful person. Because, you know, people will understand. People truly will understand, you know, when, when they see... You know, look, oh gosh, you know, I, I know, you know, I've, I've been in her shoes before. I know what she must have been going through. I, I know the stress. I've been at that same point. So tell me, now, let's get this out here. We have been arguing. And she got really mad at me. And I told her, you know, for all the stuff that you've put me through, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I think she went out in the garage. And? And there's antifreeze out there. Because she was commenting, it's like, well, that kills cats. And it's like, yeah, it also kills people. During this very interview, investigators were finally able to confirm antifreeze was behind Sarah's illness. McCamus has just heard information that could only be known by those involved. This kind of slip is crucial evidence for a prosecution, so he needs Diane to repeat this with the full understanding of her rights in mind. Unless there's some other stuff, that I'm, I'll, I'm going to inform you in, uh, here in just a second. Okay, once we're done with this, there's, I'm going to tell you some other things, okay? But I know you, I've checked and I know you don't have any kind of criminal history because you're not a bad person. So I just have to read you this real quick, okay? And then I'm going to go ahead and when we're done with this and then I'm going to inform you about some of the other stuff. And then hopefully we can come to an agreement, okay? Reading a suspect their rights inevitably triggers caution and guarded answers. McCamus needs to repair his rapport with Diane, or he risks her demanding a lawyer and shutting down completely. I know you're not being completely honest. I thought, with the type of person you are, now realizing that we know, I thought you would come in here and, and give an explanation as to, and to say why you did what you did because that's part of the process for going, you know what? I screwed up a little bit. That's not normally me, but, and then tell me the reasons why. And I completely understand the reasons why I think I've been pretty decent with you. And I'm going to continue to be decent with you, Diane, because I deal with people that are really bad 
just career criminals. They don't care about anything. And then I deal with some people that are very similar to you that are, that are good people. And then, you know, these reasons come up that good people just have little slip ups in life. Just a little hiccup is all. Yeah, yeah but I, this is more than just a hiccup. Yeah. I mean, so tell me about it, Diane. There's a lot of arguments. And to put it really short and sweet, I knew they were drinking antifreeze. And I was so mad at them, I didn't want to take them in. I delayed. Until now, Diane has maintained it was only Sarah who drank antifreeze. By claiming she knew they consumed it, Diane concedes that at least Sean and potentially Mark were also poisoned. McCamus' tactics are paying off, so he accelerates towards a direct accusation. Diane, you knew that they were drinking antifreeze. Mm -hmm. You knew that. They didn't. We both know that. You knew, Diane, because you were giving it to them. I didn't know what else to do. I really didn't. I understand. A diligent defense could argue Diane didn't know what to do about her family's suicide attempts. So this still isn't a real confession, but she's plainly close to giving in. And McCamus needs to extract evidence undeniable to a jury. To achieve this, he closes what little space remains between him and Diane, positioning himself as an attentive confidant. Well, tell me about it, Diane. That's why I'm here to listen. I'm here to... I'm here this you tell me about it, Diane. Tell me everything that was going on. Just a lot of arguments. Both Sean and Sarah were just basically I don't know trash the house, they would do whatever they wanted to do and never helped support or even contribute. How long had you been giving them the antifreeze before they finally got, like before Sean passed and before Sarah got to the point that she was? Maybe a couple of days. And what were you putting it in? Coca-Cola. What else? I think that was it. How much would you put in? I don't know. Just a little bit. And why just a little bit? I think I didn't want to hurt them. Did you just want it to be quick and painless? Mm -hmm. Is that what you wanted? So you didn't want them to feel a bunch of pain. You did, okay. You just wanted, and from your knowledge and as a nurse, then you, you just you just wanted to get it to them, and then they would just pass pass on quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. And when you say a little bit, how much is a little bit? couple of teaspoons, maybe? So you pour them a Coke, and then while you pour them the Coke, that's when you put the antifreeze in the Coke? Mm -hmm. Okay. How long did you think it would take to before I, they finally would pass? I had no clue. I don't remember. You know, how, how often? Was this, was this every day? Or how many times a day, I guess I should say? Once a day. Once a day. And you say it started out with a couple tablespoons, but then when it wasn't killing them, then it, it maybe it moved on to just a little bit more and more. Maybe. I don't remember. 
How long ago did you start with Sarah to give her the antifreeze? Maybe a couple weeks ago. Okay. In her benevolence, Diane wanted to deliver quick and painless deaths. In reality, there's no way she couldn't see that Mark, Sean, and Sarah suffered terribly. Though the body quickly converts ethylene glycol, the resulting chemicals are slow to metabolize, delaying the onset of symptoms. Even in cases of a single fatal dosage, it typically takes 72 hours of headaches, fatigue, confusion, and profuse vomiting to reach the final stages of coma and eventual death. Let's trust Diane's timeline for a moment. Sarah was poisoned over four days, surviving well past the 72-hour life expectancy for untreated antifreeze poisoning. This indicates that administering small doses over time prolonged Sarah's suffering. But it gets worse. Evidence will later show that Sean's torment was drawn out for weeks. So you've been giving it to hers for some, how, how long before she got real sick, um, a week and a half ago, or almost two maybe, weeks ago? Maybe four days. Okay. So you've been giving it for four days to her, but she hadn't been real sick, and then all of a sudden that Saturday is when she started to get real sick. When I had stopped. Okay. And then after she got real sick, you waited then, basically, from what you said earlier, you waited for for her, okay. Did you think that, she, and you said you thought she was gonna die, mm -hmm. and that's why you waited that long? Maybe. I wasn't even thinking, I don't think. I didn't. What do you mean by that? I just. I was actually afraid she was going to die then. It's like, what did I do? Diane doggedly minimizes her knowledge, memory, the extent of her planning, and ultimately her intent. Pay attention to when she expresses remorse or paints her actions as impulsive. These points do not hold up to scrutiny, as we'll see when McCamus questions the amount of antifreeze used. Where's the antifreeze now? It's in the garage. It's in the garage. How many bottles of antifreeze had you used um, on them? Not that much. It's, there's still like half a bottle. There's still half a bottle left? Okay. Are we talking like... Because you say you don't remember, so are we talking like 15 to 20? Um, oh, no. It'd never be that much. Not that much? Oh, no. Okay, so how many total then? If you... Maybe two or three? I mean, it wasn't that much. Okay, so you ordered two or How big are the bottles? Oh, it'd be a gallon. Okay, so you ordered two or three gallon bottles of yeah. the Okay. Some went into the cars, but... A search of Diane's home would in fact uncover three opened bottles of antifreeze, including an industrial grade brand that her brother claimed no one in the family had reason to own. Each bottle had been partially used, and they were collectively missing about three liters of pure ethylene glycol. Assuming a lethal dosage of 1.4 milliliters per kilogram of body weight, Diane's little bit of antifreeze is enough to kill 35 adults. Had you thought of other, I mean, why did you decide that you were going to use antifreeze to do it? Why not some other means? Because I had read online it was pretty easy to do. Okay. And where online did you read that? Oh, gosh. On Google. Okay. So you Googled it? Mm -hmm. When you went in, you know, because when Google pops up, your search, how did you search for that? Oh, you just type it in. Well, what did you type in? Like antifreeze poisoning? I don't know. How long before uh, Mark died did you do that search? Oh, gosh. I don't remember. 
I mean, was it a couple of weeks, a couple of days, maybe a couple of months? Maybe a couple of days. Okay. This is another understatement that evidence will later demolish. Mark was first observed unwell on April 6, 2012, 14 months before this interview. However, activity on Diane's computer shows her research commenced on December 4, 2011, when she searched for the lethal doses of ethylene glycol, mineral spirits, aspirin, Tylenol, and Mark's prescription medications. This was a full four months before she started poisoning him, and certainly longer than a year ago. Further searches in the following days were somehow less discreet, exploring topics such as how do bipolars kill themselves, how to kill your husband, and how to kill and get away with it. So, right after you did the search then, is that when you started it? Not with Mark. When did you start with Mark? I didn't. I don't think I did it on Mark. Then. You've got to be honest about everything again. Let's not keep going over this because we're. I just want to feel you're finally starting to do the right thing. You've got to be honest with me about everything. When did you start with Mark? A couple of days before. Okay. So you did this, had you already had the antifreeze at that point, or did you order it after you did this, the Google search? I ordered it after. So you did the Google search and then you ordered it. And then after you got it, did you pretty much immediately start giving it to Mark? Pretty soon. Yeah. Okay. How many, how many doses or how many days did it take? For him? McCamus is rewarded for pushing past Diane's memory lapses as she thoughtlessly undermines her lack of intent. Ordering the antifreeze after her research proves she didn't turn to a household item as an impulsive crime of opportunity. She obtained it specifically for the murders. And McCamus will similarly trick her into sabotaging her own account of Mark's death. I don't think so. Okay, so he started getting sick on Friday. What about Saturday? Did you give him? Mm -hmm. Why did you stop giving it to him? Why did you only give it to him for three days? And then while he's sick, why didn't you continue to give it to him? I just didn't feel like it. I don't know. I almost have changed my mind at that point. Does that make sense? Okay. But he's, if you had changed your mind at that point, why didn't you try to get him some help? Because you knew he was sick and well, he, was, he was still with it and he, you know, he would, I'd say, you know, let's go to the hospital and he would keep telling me no. And it sounds like then after he started to get sick, once he got to the point where he was so bad, that it sounds like you just waited until he passed and then you called 911. So you knew he was dead before you called 911. Okay. Did you check him for a pulse, or how did you know you, you did, and there was no pulse? And obviously from your training, then you, you were aware that he was dead. And, okay. How long had he been dead before you called 911? Maybe five minutes. Okay. Diane repeatedly avows she had a change of heart, whether when taking Sarah to the ER or sparing Mark from more poison. This could open the door to a milder charge than first-degree murder. Yet, she also admits to ensuring Mark had no pulse before seeking help. Any tug of war in her guilt-ridden mind counts for little. When she willfully denied Mark any chance at survival. And then Sean. How did, how did stuff get started with Sean? Sean would be interfering with whatever I would do to the point where he was getting into my work and I would have to tell him, you need to leave, you know, go to your room, go do something. He would just, how can I explain this? Considering how eagerly Diane has vented about Mark, it's clear she feels more confident justifying his murder. She'll have a harder time painting herself as righteous when it comes to Sean. 
So if he was just a constant bother, wouldn't leave you alone. Like you said, he's interfering with you with your work. He, he was almost to the point of inappropriate at times. I mean, to the point where he would walk into the bathroom if the door was shut. I mean, just really bizarre stuff. And just got, he was such an interference and a bother, you just said, you, you can't take it anymore. Oh, he was more than a bother. More than a bother, okay. Yeah. Would a pest, would that be a good word for it? No, it was more than that. Even more than that? Yeah. What, how would you describe it then? <laughs> I'm lousy at explaining. Let's take stock of Diane's motives. She thought it necessary to kill Mark for being an aggressive husband and neglectant father. The extent of his abuse contested by other family members. Sean was simply too annoying to bear, and Sarah was a lazy financial burden who failed to meet Diane's expectations. One might be worried for her other children, Brianna and Rachel, but Diane doesn't seem to show them the same vitriol. What did Rachel say about all this? She really hasn't said that much. What's her involvement? doesn't know a thing other than her and Sarah don't get along that well because Sarah used to beat her up. Sarah would beat me up. So Rachel has zero knowledge whatsoever. When we talk to her, is that what she's going to tell us? Mm -hmm. She has no idea. She has no clue. So you never mentioned to her what you're doing? Had you been giving any to her? No. What about Brianna? No. Why not those two? Because I love them. And I wish I hadn't done it, ever. With only confirmation that Diane was involved, McCamus examines the possibility that Rachel either helped or was potentially a victim herself. But police are searching the Stouty home at this very moment, and they'll uncover something that prompts McCamus to question Diane again the following morning. Now, something else I wanted to talk to you about a little bit more, and we talked about it yesterday, and you really have to be honest with me here, Diane, because we're going to find out everything eventually, and it's, it's much better you know, for us to just find it out from you. Okay? And I'd asked you about this yesterday, um, uh, about... Rachel's knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, how much knowledge did she have about what was going on? Well, she knew they were sick. Right. But as far as the cause, I think she knew. Okay. You got to be honest with me about this, Diane. Mm -hmm. What if she said differently? I don't know. Because I never told her. You recognize that? That's her writing. Right. That's Rachel's writings, right? Mm -hmm. Does that refresh your memory any? Not really. I didn't read really all of it. Well, we both know this is Rachel's writing. Mm -hmm. The piece of writing he's just presented is some random benign diary entry, allowing an unguarded Diane to identify Rachel's handwriting. She's been stripped of the ability to question who authored the bombshell McCamus is about to drop. So we found this. She says, I wish sometimes that I could avoid the future and keep looking to the past. It's sad when I realize how my father will pass on in the next two months and how Sean, my brother, will move on shortly after. And yet, it's really helpful. I'm being warned so that I have more time to prepare and cope. Also, I get to have Dad's car when he's gone. It'll be tough getting used to the changes, but everything will work out. 
This passage does more than confirm Diane lied about Rachel's knowledge. The entry is dated June 13, 2011, 10 months before Mark's symptoms appeared in April 2012. This is undeniable proof that Diane's planning was far more extensive than she'd let on, and that Sean's death was planned even before Mark passed on. She'll need a stellar explanation to wriggle out of this corner. McCamus has Rachel in his sights, and will be confronting her next. McCamus wears Rachel down to not just admit knowledge of the scheme, but her key role in planning and executing it. After interviewing Rachel, McCamus brings Diane in for another interview that evening for a final confrontation. So why, why did you just not let her die? I just didn't do it. So why let her get to that point and not just go when she was, when you even said yourself you thought she was going to die anyway? Trying to change of heart. Why? I didn't want her to die. But why though? You, I mean, you let Mark die, you let Sean die, you wanted Sarah to be dead, so what was the... I just couldn't. What if I was told differently about that? It's possible too. So why don't you tell me? I know Rachel didn't want her to die at home. Why not? Because after Sean died, we had kind of like a ghost experience. So it was Rachel's idea to take her to the hospital. Rachel's interview corroborates this ghost story as a factor, but its implications don't fully emerge without context from more of Rachel's writing. Let me know what you think about this. Once upon a time, there was six. Now there were only three. Only the quiet ones are left. My mom, my little sister, and me. What does that mean? I thought that was the future she would see. And that's kind of the utopia that you guys have discussed. So it would just be you three. Mm -hmm. This entry was written the day Sarah was hospitalized, and its wording assumes there are only three members of the family left. In other words, Rachel wrote this with the understanding that Sarah was as good as dead. Diane shared this view and even had the opportunity to see it through. When Sarah was still in critical condition, medical staff explained they may need to insert a tracheotomy tube to assist her breathing. Though they explained Sarah could die without it, Diane refused to permit the procedure. She and Rachel never got cold feet. They just abandoned Sarah to die in the hospital, so her ghosts wouldn't haunt their home. While this gives us a window into Diane's lack of remorse, she'll never divulge the full scope of her plan. It would be Rachel's confession that exposes how long and often they schemed, the gallons of antifreeze used, and even Sarah's potential knowledge of the plans. Though Rachel is more cooperative than her mother, winning her confession was still no small feat for McCamus. Despite how devoted Diane was to shielding her daughter from blame, Rachel would ultimately earn a lighter sentence by testifying against her mother. In January 2016, Diane submitted an Alford plea, pleading guilty to two counts of murder and one count of assault. An Alford plea acknowledges the prosecution has enough evidence to convict, but in true form, does not require Diane to admit any wrongdoing. Regardless of her denial, she's sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Though Sarah suffered neurological damage and must live aided by a carer, she would miraculously recover from falling so close to death. Mark and Sean were not so lucky. Even family and friends lacked a clear image of Mark and Diane's relationship, but Diane and Rachel robbed him of any chance to share his side of the story. 
let alone seek help for his supposed alcohol and drug abuse. Sean was executed by a mother and sister who refused to accept or support his health issues and neurodivergence, and instead chose to deny him a future.